Hello and welcome to the Lohan Academy webinar series. This is our second one in the year of 2021, and I am Wei Lu, a senior scientist here in the Academy, and I'm your host today. Today, we have a diverse group of three speakers, and they are Roberto Gatti from Tomsk State University in Russia and Conrad Lawrence Institute for Cognition and uh, of Evolution and Cognition Sciences in Vienna, Austria. And Roberto is a, uh, a biological uh, evolutionary biologist and um, <coughs> a conservation ecologist. And we also have Brian Fass from IASA International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, as well as Towson University. Brian is a systems ecologist, and he's the editor-in-chief for the journal Ecological Modeling, as well as editing. Uh, he also edits a number of other book, books, including the Encyclopedia of Ecology. And the third speaker is Roger Koppel. Um, Roger is a professor in the Whitman School of Management at Syracuse University. He's also the associate director of the school's uh, Institute for an Entrepreneurial Society. Roger is an expert uh, in Austrian eco uh, economics as well as complexity economics. And he is a past president of the Society for the Development of Austrian Economics. And uh, we're very honored to have the three of them here today to give us this talk on the nature of economic emergence, discovering your niche in the platform ecology. And noted that um, you know quite a bit of the content of this talk is based on a recent paper that they published, and the title of the paper is The Emergence of Ecological and Economic Niches. And the structure of the talk will be, uh, you know, started with uh, Brian introducing uh, ecological theory and ecological niches. And Roberto will follow up um, talking about biodiversity principles, especially uh, niche emergence. And Roger will talk about economic niches and, um, and how that happens, as well as the theory of adjacent possible. And without further ado, uh, I will pass the floor to uh, Brian to start with the uh, ecological theory and ecological niches. Um, thank you, Brian. Boundary of the organism or the system structure, we can get order and organization, self-organization going on, all right? And also keep in mind that life is not a machine. We like to um, apply the machine metaphor in a lot of places, but machines uh, degrade and run out and need refueling. Well, ecosystems need refueling as well too, but they have the sun to do that. And they actually aggrade and they self-organize and they complexify. So they are the opposite of machines. And one of the ways that they do that is through the interactions and the networks. And, and uh, Fritz Olaf Capra uh, has written a nice book on the web of life, talking about that, that it's the interconnections and the interdependencies that are really driving the, the life processes, not the, uh, the mechanisms necessarily. So go ahead. Okay, and so our motivating um, force here really is, is trying to understand ecosystems. What are the ecological theories out there that can help us uh, see how to design and manage social economic systems more sustainably? Again, going with the, the understanding that ecosystems have been around for a few billion years, and there's probably a lot we can learn from them. And in this recent book that we had uh, published called A New Ecology Systems Perspective, we highlighted nine properties of ecosystems. And then, um, and then that was in that book, but in this talk, then we're gonna take some of those and, and go forward into the economic system. So just briefly to run through those nine properties, go ahead, Roberto. The first three deal with what I had already talked about, the material constraints, the fact that the first law of thermodynamics says that ecosystems conserve matter and energy. This allows us to write balance equations. This allows us to um, account for where, where things are, right? To do the, to do the kind of, whoop, go back. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the second law, as I said, is about the transformations and that these are dissipative and irreversible systems. And so that there's a, essentially a heat tax that is taking place every time that there is work done. But it's also saying that every time that heat tax is taken, there is work being done, right? The work of self-organization and, and aggradation. And then the other constraint that we have is, is the, the periodic table, right? That we have only so many chemical elements as our basic building blocks. And of course, we know that they can combine in many other ways. But life selects some of those elements. There's about 20 to 25 of them that life um, prefers. There's another um, handful of them that are actually deleterious to life if we get even small amounts or if we get too much amount of them. 
But, um, but yeah, working within understanding the chemistry of life is, is part of that material constraint. Go ahead. And then the, the origin properties also that we see, and this is where, um, again, back to the idea that, that life is not a machine, is that ecosystems have this ability to take the energy, please go back, that is there, thank you, and, um, and essentially move further away from thermodynamic equilibrium. They are, they are, again, building biomass, they're building structure, they're complexifying as they do this. And we refer to this as physically driven biological aspect because it's really a physical property. It's an energy flow property, but it's a, bio, it's a thing biology does, right? It's not something that, that non-biology does. Um, but the second part of that, the number five there, is that ecosystems also co-evolve and adapt to the prevailing conditions. So this is the biologically driven biological aspect. So not only are they able to take energies in and, and complexify and self-organize, but they do it in a way that they can adapt then to the changing conditions. And that's what we think about with the evolutionary processes that are there. Go ahead. And so then that brings us to the last uh, four properties, which are the phenomenological ones that we just observe out there. And the first one is that there is a lot of diversity. So over time, the planet has uh, diversified in terms of the structure and functions that are out there. Second, that we see networks pretty much everywhere. Um, and operating in networks. And for example, one of the lines that we have in the paper is the idea that competitive market process is a cooperative network or is in a cooperative network, right? So it starts with the network. So if you look on the upper right corner there, you have the ABC autocatalytic cycle, a uh, very simple network, but, but uh, just making the point that they're, they're each doing something that is, that is reinforcing and feeding into the other one. And then uh, element D comes along and if element D in that case is competing with element B and the focus in ecology and, and economic literature would be on the competition aspect of B and D. But in fact, what they're doing is they're competing to fit into a cooperative network. And if D does that better than B, then it gets selected for, but it's not getting selected for in isolation just because it wants to compete with B, it's competing to be in the network, right? So at, the, at a higher level or more fundamental level of organization is actually the network, not just the competition. So, okay. Go ahead. And then number eight had to do with the hierarchies that we see. So there's asymmetric um, dependencies from top, uh, top down and bottom up um, organization. And the last one, number nine, has to do with the amount of information that is being uh, stored in these systems at the genetic level, at the chemical level, at the process information level. And so again, over time, there's been this accumulation of, of information. So those nine properties are, are what we think as, uh, as a group of systems ecologists that put that book together, how, how ecosystems function and, and some of the, the key, key ideas behind that. And then, like I said, to take some of those pieces and see what we can learn when we apply them to social economic systems. So go ahead to the, to the next one. And so then I'm gonna give a little bit more ecology background as we, we build into the, uh, into the uh, economic niche. And that's just a, a little bit about the niche itself. And so when we think of the habitat, we think of the place where an organism is living and the niche is more specific about the role that it plays, both the role in terms of, um, you know, intraspecies interactions that it might have with, with, uh, with mating or with, uh, with uh, herd dynamics in this case, or it's trophic dynamics and, and other influences that it has with interspecies um, interactions. So, so the, the niche we think of as the role that it plays. So go ahead. And the niche has been discussed a lot in, um, in ecology the entire 20th century. And one of the best formalizations of it came out in the 1960s by Hutchinson, a famous uh, ecologist who, I, who said that the, I, the niche can be described as a multidimensional space of the factors that determine the species presence in that environment and, and, and its activities that it does. Now, of course, drawing a multidimensional space is quite difficult. So we are looking here in just three dimensions. And he referred to this as a hypervolume. And, and the idea was that there's a fundamental niche where the species could be functioning if it were um, kind of in, a, in an open space. Um, now, of course, we know that there are no open spaces because, again, they work through networking and through interactions. And so what we actually observe is a realized niche. It's a, it's a smaller space than what the fundamental niche would be. And so there you can see that the realized niche is um, yeah, some, some subsection of that hypervolume. So go ahead and uh, that's the theory behind it. And here's just some examples. You can see um, in this, you could have like precipitation and temperature as two of the variables. 
and you have a fundamental niche of where a species might be, but the actual realized niche might be much smaller than that, or, or some of the other examples there on the right. But I want to draw your attention to the figure on the bottom, which is talking about where two different species start to overlap in those niche spaces. And, um, and this also gave ecologists a lot of fits for a long time, essentially then leading to this idea of the competitive exclusion principle, um, which is the next slide. And the competitive exclusion principle, go ahead, Roberta, thank you. Yeah, was the idea that no two species can actually occupy the same niche. And it became a, actually a bit of a tautology that if they saw them occupying the same niche, then they would say, well, they must be different niches, right? I'll get to that in just a second. Um, but the idea is that this competitive exclusion principle actually leads to niche partitioning, right? So that um, you will split that niche into smaller and smaller pieces, and that's how speciation actually occurs. And so they will overlap less and less because they will specialize. And we do see examples of that. So go ahead to the next slide where you can see, um, for example, birds might um, specialize on a very particular part of the tree. And so you could say, well, they all are using the same tree, but they're not overlapping because one uses the, the top crown and one uses the edges and one uses the inner part and one uses more of the base of the tree. Or they might differ because of uh, beak size and they are using different parts of the, um, you know, fishing for different, different insects that way. Um, so niche partitioning was thought to be the answer to coexistence of species that make living in similar ways. And it was a way to reduce the interspecific competition by using the resources a little bit differently. Um, one of the challenges with this, though, is that it, if, it, it, it um, assumes that there is a fixed space that they are partitioning, right? So let's go to the next slide. And really, it's a too simplistic view. It, it, it views the environment as static and that there's this narrow organism environment relationship. And so therefore, what, um, what we've been promoting and, and, and studying is this idea of niche emergence and niche expansion. So rather than a space that is being cut up into smaller and smaller chunks, for example, the tree um, being utilized by different birds in different ways, that each species itself actually um, has a dynamic feedback that allows for more niches to emerge. And so this idea that diversity begets diversity and an expansion of the niche space rather than a partitioning of the niche space. And that's really the fundamental uh, difference between our approach and I guess the more traditional approaches. And that leads us to things like the theory of the adjacent possible, how that expansion then um, creates again, new opportunities. And, and that was the idea then that we're going to take into, um, into the economics literature. So, but before we do that, um, my part is now done, I believe. I'll turn it over to Roberto to get into even some more details about this niche emergence. Thank you, Brian. So I'll go a bit deeper in talking about diversity and biological properties of diversity. Let me see if I can change the slide now. Okay. So uh, I try to switch it back to the speaker. Let's see if it works. You still see Brian, but anyway. Let's see. Okay, maybe I'll stop and share again. Let's see now if it works. No way. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. So I won't show during the presentation. But uh, so uh, the, the the important thing is now how species that fill up these niches really uh, work together and in coexistence to, uh, to express this biological diversity. So the, this biological diversity that we uh, briefly call biodiversity has some properties. So there are uh, at least five properties that we identified in this new, uh, new vision of niche emergence. One is biodiversity as a autopoietic process. The second one is that biodiversity uh, could be considered an autocatalytic process. Also that biodiversity is a three-dimensional process and a fractal one. So this goes together, as you will see, at the end you see that biodiversity can be considered an emergent process. 
as we see, uh, no, like the the uh, droning ants um, or, or uh, this uh, typical example of a tree growing over a dead tree. So there is a sort of reinforcement between uh, what we already have in an ecosystem and what can be uh, and what can evolve from that. So. Uh, just to uh, uh, keep you know, the time frame of our discussion, imagine to uh, compress just in a single hour for something like 570 million years. Uh, we will see that uh, the first uh, vertebrae, you no, know, uh, at least the first the first fish, uh, and uh, can evolved uh, after the first hour. Uh, the the first terrestrial plant uh, needed about two hours and a half. And the first mammal uh, needed about 7, uh, 45, seven hours, 45 minutes uh, in this uh, imaginary uh, uh, watch. So our species, and this is something that would uh, uh, increase our awareness of what the place we have in doing the evolution and what we can learn from the evolutionary process to adapt our 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 niche concept, no, our uh, economic niche to the ecologic niche, is that we evolved just before uh, twelve. So just a few minutes uh, up to the end of the full hour uh, is our place in this world. And this is another nice example. I like this figure because you can really realize in this sort of helix of evolution, uh, our place. No, is just on the last slice of this uh, long helix that for almost uh, half or more than a half of uh, its story and look uh, about two billion years passed before the first living beings emerged from, from almost nothing. So uh, this creates our awareness and this shows us what we can learn from biological processes. So let's start uh, briefly uh, examining the five properties of biodiversity. The first one is that biodiversity is autopoietic. So an autopoietic system by definition is a system that is capable of reproducing and maintaining itself. Now there is a flow of energy and matter and information that goes inside the system. So the components and the connection re-modulate uh, the energy, the matter, the, matter, the information and release waste, release waste, release uh, uh, energy in other forms, most as uh, entropy uh, and is a system that we can consider as a self-determining, self-reproducing and self-restructuring. This definition of our poetic system was first proposed by Francisco Varela and Umberto Maturana uh, in their book Autopoiesis and Cognition, the Realization of the Living. Um, and this is a key concept in biodiversity because from this uh, we can uh, define what I call biodiversity-related niche differentiation theory. Uh, according to this idea, uh, when we, uh, we have a natural system, so in natural conditions of immigration and denigration uh, of species in uh, individuals into an ecosystem with every environmental situation, species in some way, directly or indirectly, thanks to the presence of the, their own uh, individuals and their life rules tend to increase the number of potentially available niches for the colonization of other species. So in this way, what they do, they enhance the limit imposed by the biosal uh, hypervolume, the one that Brian uh, uh, introduced, you know, the, the Atkinsonian niche uh, idea, until there's a reaching of the carrying capacity of the ecosystem. So the why we can say that biodiversity is opoietic because it's a system that is able to produce more of its own complexity just have a look at the figure a where there is the interaction uh, among species that uh, interacting with the environment and so we they use the environment uh, and they stay in the environment to uh, produce more uh, of its own complexity than the one produced by simply the environment. So of course we have a, a bigger flow of energy, uh, a higher release of entropy, but at the end the result is that we have a higher number of interactions and so of species. So this is uh, the autopoietic idea. This was uh, formally, uh, I won't spend much words now on uh, the equation, but this was formally uh, addressed in a, a simple uh, differential equation that just says that the number mt, the number of niches in a certain moment depends on Na, so the number of niches in a, uh, uh, already present in the environment and of a facilitation that this is phi 
variable, the facilitation coefficient, uh, that also is uh, constrained by the carrying capacity. So if we imagine the niche, you know, the three-dimensional niche as this uh, sphere that should stay you know, inside, like the realized niche should stay inside this cube, uh, if we add more species as like you know, the roots of an imaginary tree, uh, of course, the roots will expand the tree and the, the niche would emerge, so increase the size uh, compared to the available uh, niche dimension that are in the environment. So this would create more possibilities for other species that we can uh, imagine as the leaves of the tree to live within an environment that was prohibited before uh, for many of the species that now can live in that ecosystem. This brings up, bring us to, to directly to the concept of biodiversity as an autocatalytic process. Uh, as you see uh, from the biodiversity, so from the theory before, uh, species themselves can create favorable conditions for the colonization of other species. And this allow the presence together, you no, know, the coexistence and the fundamental mechanism that support this coexistence is the creation of the diversity related niches. So what we developed in this new idea, we uh, start thinking about a simple autocatalytic auto process, you no, know, where you have in uh, the upper right uh, figure, the AB uh, molecules that interact uh, between themselves and then in some way create the uh, BA uh, and AB and BA themselves can be the catalyst of the reactions between B and A. So it's a si simple system, but it's very powerful because uh, from the simplicity of its elements can increase so much what we call the ECORAF set. So it's a set, a group of sets uh, that contains species that can uh, act as a catalyst of the reactions. So if we consider no, the, the, the typical definition of a catalytic process from the chemistry, we see that the catalyst uh, has the ability to increase the rate of a reaction. And uh, in this way, uh, reactions can occur faster and with less energy. Uh, so the catalysts are not consumed, but are always re recycled in the process. And we just need a tiny amount of them. So a single uh, reaction can be said to have undergone autocatalysis uh, and so to be autocatalytic if this reaction uh, and the product of the reaction itself is the catalyst for that reaction. So in uh, the ecological process, no, in the biodiversity considered as an autocatalytic process, we see that species increase biodiversity just acting as a catalyst, exactly as in the chemical process. So with a catalyst, the species and speciation can occur faster and with less energy. So species are not consumed as well in this process because they are recycled in new species, exactly the process of evolution. And so in, you can see as in the example or in the figure here, only sometimes a tiny amount of species are required. Maybe the most important, the so-called keystone species. Imagine in this case, this sequoia tree, just one species, one individual, or one species can host several hundred species and in this way can uh, enhance and uh, uh, let emerge the niche of other species. So in a biological process, this single speciation event is said to have undergone autocatalysis because uh, the speciation product itself is the catalyst for that speciation. So together we have a set of uh, so-called collectively autocatalytic uh, events. So uh, the uh, autocatalysis of biodiversity bring us to the sort of the vitalistic formulation of natural law, because we now have to consider cooperation, facilitation, avoidance of competition, niche displacement, and niche emergence as the most important uh, phenomena that characterize this process of autocatalysis. The third, uh, and I will not spend much word on that, and I won't dedicate too much, but just to uh, let you uh, uh, frame all these uh, processes, is that biodiversity is 3D. Because we uh, uh, often uh, uh, forgot to consider the third dimension of biodiversity. We are used to consider everything as a flat thing, you know? even the ecosystem sometimes. Uh, we consider them, but if we imagine the bi-dimensional space, of course, 
uh, as soon as the number of individuals of one species increases, there won't be much space, as in the case you know, of Balanus and Ctamalus uh, in this example. Uh, so uh, what, what happens that uh, enlarging the available niche, so expanding it, and then we will see emerging from the basal niche, uh, there will be other possibilities for other species to fill up the, uh, the space, the, the hypothetical space. We try to uh, empirically prove this uh, idea of uh, biodiversity as 3D when we uh, correlate the mean biodiversity uh, in a terrestrial environment with the mean canopy height. Uh, we saw from satellite data uh, that uh, the mean canopy height, so the uh, uh, average height of a forest very well correlates with the biodiversity that is contained within. So uh, as you can see from the uh, uh, left figure, uh, the correlation is quite strong all over the world. So it's globally, it's a, a global uh, ecological process uh, that would explain why uh, there is the need of this third dimension to increase the available space for uh, biodiversity. And this, of course, relates very uh, uh, well with the uh, concept of biodiversity as a fractal thing. Uh, uh, most of us uh, know already the uh, fractal concept, know that we can see also in natural, in many natural uh, elements, such as, for instance, mussel shells or uh, snow flocks, uh, plant leaves, or even the cauliflower, the broccoli, you know, the Romanian broccoli. And that's what was, of course, um, uh, put in a mathematical forms by uh, several mathematicians. One of the most known is uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, uh, that created this set, that he, the, the Julia set, uh, uh, of the fractal that you see that uh, iterate itself. So it's a self iteration process. As biodiversity can be considered a self iteration process, we see that if we want to really understand why we have uh, many species in some part of the world uh, and much less in other parts, uh, it depends on this fractal dimension. Uh, I will be brief on that, I won't take much time, but just uh, uh, consider that the, 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 the classic view of this latitudinal gradient of biodiversity that we have on our planet is based on the concept that because climate uh, can in uh, some way influence the primary uh, production. Uh, this can rise the biomass. No? For instance, imagine in the tropics when the climate is very favorable, of course, the biomass is higher and increasing the biomass, we can have a higher number of individuals and this can control the number of species. But there is a problem in the classical view of uh, the latitudinal gradient because uh, having higher number of individuals doesn't mean having a uh, higher number of species. We can have several individuals of the same species or even uh, a monospecific environment. So uh, what matters instead in this uh, concept, even in the latitudinal gradient of biodiversity, is that the combining temperature, humidity, so climate, then uh, primary productivity in these three uh, uh, curves, let's say, that uh, come across the planet, we can create the fractal dimension or a, so, a sort of 2D, 3D dimension. And of course, if we have this box that is bigger because the fractal dimension is, uh, is bigger, of course, is uh, 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 as we call VN, no, the volume of the fractal dimension is higher. Of course, we can fill with more species this evolutionary process. So it just depends on the dimension of the box the dimension of the ecological niche, because in this bigger box on the tropics, for instance, we can fit more species. And of course, the fractal uh, evolution of these species can fill the box better. Fifth and last, that's everything that brings us, so all these properties bring us to the final main property of biological diversity that we identified in this paper published recently in uh, the Journal of Theoretical Biology. What we, uh, what we said that. So we started from the previous concept, you were reminded about, of uh, eco rough set. No, an eco rough set is an ecological uh, uh, autocatalytic set. Uh, it depends on food that you can see this uh, uh, red F1, F2, F3. Uh, so on food sources, and then it can evolve. 
uh, but the eco rough set it doesn't stand alone it's always interacting with other sets so interacting with other sets during time can create this evil rough set so it's an evolutionary autocatalytic set and the evolutionary autocatalytic set uh, takes place because we are used to consider niche partitioning as the main process in uh, evolution of species but we need to add a second dimension that is niche emergence so as the uh, the dotted arrow red arrow that you see on the left uh, this process is an average between niche partitioning and niche emergence because niche partitioning is a bit limited if we have only one dimension in niche partitioning the maximum amount of uh, uh, of of uh, limited uh, niche that we can have is uh, nine if we start from one square uh, it could be 27 if we consider niche emergence so uh, you see that the expansion and the emergence of niche uh, is something inscribed within the uh, biological process of uh, evolution and biodiversity and we uh, suggested for the first time in that paper, um, an example, a typical example of uh, uh, a niche emergence uh, from uh, the very famous you know, uh, symbiotic relationship that there is between aphids and ants. So consider at a certain point during evolution, uh, we had aphids that were feeding on uh, bacteria mostly. Uh, but some of these bacteria, are, so this is you know, part A of the figure, some of these bacteria start to become uh, uh, symbiotic with the gut, within the gut of the aphids, and allow them to uh, use, uh, to feed on the sap of the plants. Uh, so in some ways, bacteria became the, cat the catalyst of the reaction between aphids and plants. So a, a, a completely new, a sort of brand new niche uh, could emerge from this uh, process from this symbiotic relationship and uh, aphids instead of eating bacteria started to eating plant sap. After a certain evolutionary time then, and we move to, pro to, to part C, the interaction between aphids and plants became uh, more complex because of course plants need to be protected by the uh, huge attack of this plant pest no? that sometimes is considered a parasite for plants so they started to recruit uh, an ally that is ladybugs ladybugs are uh, uh, insects that feed on aphids so they can in mass and they are very uh, uh, very useful now in agriculture for instance in uh, organic agriculture because uh, of course, it, they, they can really limit the amount of aphids that we have. But at the same time, no, so the catalytic process created by the plants uh, that allowed ladybugs to feed over aphids uh, created another loop because aphids start to be catalytic, as a, to work as a catalyst for the reaction between them and the ants. Because imagine the ants, uh, they have, of course, this uh, ability to protect the aphids. Uh, they, they can protect the aphids, but they want something, of course, in return. And the aphids start to produce this uh, very sugar, uh, sugar product. No, they, they, they derive from, from the sap of the plants, uh, this honeydew, uh, and the, the production of this honeydew that is donated to the ants. Uh, so it, we, we often in the biology say that the uh, ants can milk uh, the aphids to uh, receive this honeydew uh, and in, of course there is now a relationship another symbiotic relationship that emerges from the catalysis uh, so the, the ants and the, the aphids that catalyze the reaction with the ladybugs and together because they receive protection they can escape the attack from lady ladybugs this five species system uh, is uh, to our knowledge, the first system uh, that has been identified as an autocatalytic emergent uh, process because it emerged during the evolution and it works because of the autocatalysis of the species that composed the system by that side. This brings us to the most, uh, the more eco uh, economical aspects because uh, this says much about niche emergence. It says that niche emergence in ecology is almost uh, unpredictable because it would be very difficult now going back to the time to uh, uh, imagine that aphids could have 
uh, uh, created a sort of symbiosis with bacteria and this would catalyze the reaction with the plants and so on and so on. So it's very difficult to predict that. The, the question is now, so can we predict evolution? Of course we can in a limited way. So at least there are some examples. In general, it's extremely difficult to predict evolutionary patterns. For instance, no, a typical example is the mutualistic coevolution. Darwin predicted when he saw this moth, the Xanthopan morgani, he said, okay, there is this very long propagate, so it might be uh, 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 an orchid or a flower with a very long spur that uh, this moth can fertilize. Otherwise, there would be no way for uh, the species to uh, to survive. Actually, Darwin, what first what uh, what we first saw was the, the the orchid. Then the moth was discovered. So uh, just looking at the at the orchid with this very very long spur, Darwin imagined the existence of an insect that could fertilize this orchid. This was the first example of a possibility to predict something, at least something in evolution. Another example is co-evolution or parallel evolution that we see between placentals that are mostly mammals living uh, in most of the continents and marsupials that just live in Oceania. Uh, as you see, their uh, uh, no, uh, parallel species resemble each other, uh, even if they, they evolve from completely different phylogenetic lines. Uh, this is because, of course, they really fit the same uh, niche in different continents, of course. So filling the same niche, uh, they converge their uh, even uh, physical shape, no, uh, they uh, phenotypic, uh, uh, phenotypic uh, resemblance. Uh, everything from the biological side uh, gives us hints and gave us you no know, the idea to develop this new uh, concept of economic niche emergence. Because if in biology is almost unpredictable, uh, how uh, the emergence in economy can be predicted. Imagine from a computer point of view. No, there was a computer at a certain point in time. But then who could have imagined the evolution, no, the emergence of Amazon or eBay, no, like e-commerce or even mousepad or DVDs. So this is everything that uh, I'll pass the floor to Roger to uh, explain better to us. Of course, very good. Giving yes, voice to Roger, all this. Uh, this course, uh, of course, converts to a main question, how to address us towards a sustainable future. Okay, okay Roger, if you want, I can uh, stop sharing my screen so you will manage directly your slide. What do you prefer? Yes, please. Okay. I'll, I'll handle it. I think I'll okay. handle it anyway. Let's see. All right. Um, okay, I can't see my own screen very well. How's that look? It's okay, I think, yes, just. How's that look, a little better? Yes, perfect. Okay, lovely. All right, and let me just shrink something there. Okay, wonderful. All right, economic, okay, so so this is beautiful image of sort of autocatalysis and ramifying niches and so on. What's the, what um, picture of evolution are we getting? We're getting a picture of evolution as autocatalytic, ramifying and creative. So it's autocatalytic because you have this network of interacting agents that are somehow enabling one another. It's ramifying because it's, it's the ceaseless branching process and it's creative because that ceaseless branching process is generating new forms endlessly. Um, now, I, I don't think we've said uh, all that we might say about the mechanisms of this kind of uh, ramifying autocatalytic evolution. I'm going to borrow from Francois Chacolb, I guess how you'd say his name, that uh, his claim that natural selection works like a tinkerer who does not know exactly what he's going to produce, but uses whatever he finds around him, whether it be pieces of string, fragments of wood, or old cardboard. So evolutionary processes of the sort we're talking about today, um, they're, they just kind of cobble together existing elements uh, not in order to sort of create some highly designed perfect thing, the perfect conception. No, just like cobbling together the elements to make a workable thing, whether it be a bit of new technology 
or a new organism. And I'll give you an example from the uh, biosphere. Uh, penguins and dolphins are both descended from land animals uh, that, that came to, to do a lot of swimming. They came to live in or high, uh, uh, the ocean, at least, you know, a lot. But the, the animal from which the, the dolphins descend, they had tails, they're kind of alligator looking things, they had tails. So, so nature was able to give the dolphin this big powerful tail that lets them stand up in water like that. Uh, whereas the penguin, as, as a bird, birds have, they have tail feathers, they have no tails. So nature didn't have the materials to give a powerful swimming tail to the penguin who must therefore, as it were, fly through water rather than um, use a powerful tail such as the dolphin. So, you know, nature has to have the materials to work with, it's a tinkerer. Well, the same thing happens in the evolution of technology. Uh, you know, everybody in the late 19th century, that say many persons, un uh, understood about gliders, they understood because of the nascent, uh, the recently emergent automobile industry about small, reliable uh, internal combustion engines. Okay? And so a lot of people figured, uh, you know, understood that maybe if I can combine gliders and, and uh, these small internal combustion engines, I can get powered heavier than air flight. And it was kind of a lot of tinkering required to make that combination. And it was a bit of a chance event. The Wright brothers were first there. Um, I say that with some hesitation. I know there's some contention over whether they were really first. Um, so, so what is the logic of this, you know, what is the tinkery logic of evolution then and the kind of systems we're talking about? You have at any moment the adjacent possible, the things that could possibly happen one step forward. The adjacent possible contains opportunities for combining existing elements. What is possible in adjacent possible is a new combination. Some of these uh, possibilities are seized, most are not, and, the, and then the system iterates. You have a new adjacent possible containing a different set of opportunities for combining elements, some of which are seized, some of which are not, the system iterates, and so on. Okay? So over time in such a, a tinkery evolution, the combinatorial possibilities increase, and over time, the number of realized combinations also increase. So this gives you uh, an increase in complexity in a couple of ways. The number of you know, realized combinations, uh, and, there, and therefore there are many relationships are growing, and so you have increased com complexity in that sense, but also each of the elements that might be recombined is itself composed of a larger number of uh, elements that were self-composed of a larger number of elements and so on. So the complexity of each interacting element also grows over time in this sort of an evolutionary process. So that's kind of the evolutionary vision that we're uh, putting forward here. Um, if it's a combinatorial evolution, then as we know, there may be a combinatorial explosion as with uh, the explosion in biodiversity in the Cambrian uh, explosion, uh, or the explosion of what we call cambio diversity in the industrial revolution. So cambio diversity means diversity and variety in the things exchanged. Okay? And we see this uh, tremendous explosion in cambio diversity coincident with the industrial revolution. And it really was, I think, an explosion. Um, Beinhacker has estimated that the Anomami peoples have maybe 300 goods, uh, whereas in New York City, it's hard to count, but maybe something like 10 billion. Okay. E even if there's some terrible uh, overestimates on the New York City number, I suspect not, uh, we're still talking about just a tremendous explosion in cambio diversity. Okay. And it happened fairly quickly. Uh, and when it did, and when it did, wealth jumped. So um, Hidalgo and others uh, in this sort of complexity economics field have correctly, I think, associated uh, camp, what we are calling cambio diversity, this great diversity, variety, and multiplicity of uh, goods with wealth, with social wealth. So when the, when the uh, combinatorial explosion hit, with the industrial revolution, then almost immediately, almost instantly, there was this great leaping up of uh, GDP per capita, 
basically just like the level at which humans actually lived on average on the planet. It's global GDP per capita. So um, from really before the emergence of modern anatomically modern man until about 1800, humans on average lived at about the same level, roughly equivalent to like two to four dollars a day living standard. Okay. Um, uh, in spite of you know the famous agricultural revolution, oh, it's supposed to change everything. Some people got rich, but on average, actually made no change in the living standard, uh, no substantial change in the living standard of uh, the, of you know the average living standard of people. And then suddenly, 1800. Okay, so that today, you know, global GDP per capita is like 10 times what it was in you know before the industrial revolution. And of course, in the rich countries, it's it's like 3,000 percent greater. Um, so this is a big deal. It's like the most important thing that ever happened, really. Um, and, 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 and we attribute it, we believe this is attributable to this combinatorial explosion in this process of combinatorial evolution. And here's our kind of so-called TAP equation, TAP standing for theory of the adjacent possible. Here's our so-called TAP equation for characterizing this, this process. So here, M, M T on the left of the equal, equals that equals the number of traded goods in period T. We're saying that's equal to well whatever you started with you know before period T, plus some teeny fraction P P being a kind of probability scaling factor, some teeny fraction P of all this stuff inside the parentheses. So what is that stuff inside the parentheses? Well, the innermost term there that's just you know. M T M T minus one choose I. The, the the number of ways you can take the existing number of goods and combine I of them. Okay. So you, you take the the the, the M T minus one choose I, multiplying it by a number alpha sub I, which declines with I. It's easier to combine two things together and get something real than it is to combine three things together and get something real. Harder still to combine four things together and get something real, and so on. So um, you know, think of it like this, alpha i is the number of sort of prospective combinations that might give you a new good. And pi is the probability that such a prospective combination actually works. So um, this is a story of combinatorial evolution. I'm a little anxious about whether we've given enough time on this equation. Uh, if somebody turns on his microphone and says yes or no, uh, then that'll guide me. Um, but otherwise, I'll just move on. Uh, so this is the, the, the our sort of equation for combinatorial evolution. We recombine whatever we have and accumulate what works. That's kind of how biological evolution works, how so-called natural selection works, but also, I think, the evolution of technology. And that, that equation, there we go. That equation, of course, you know, what parameter values do you punch in? But it easily gives you, for a wide variety of parameter values, exactly the kind of behavior you see on the screen there. Go, going along, seems like nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Yes, there's growth, but it's not that big a deal. And then suddenly, kaboom, this, you know, super exponential growth happens. There we go. We even fit in another paper, some of us have even fit this in a sort of super simplified growth theory model to historical data, and it seems like it fits pretty good. It certainly fits the general pattern. We think actually it's, it's a neat fit, and we, we, we think it, it works actually quite nicely, but that is a different paper. So there is good evidence that this combinatorial process really is driving technological evolution, which in turn is driving um, human wealth, global GDP per capita. We seem to have good evidence that that's really true. So in this story, an economic, when we apply, you know, this evolutionary vision of combinatorial evolution to markets, why in this story, then an economic niche is just a potential market. Okay. New combinations of goods, create uh, new economic niches. So it might have been hard, as Roberto was really saying before, it might have been hard back here to anticipate mouse pads. But once you had the PC in the graphic interface software, so you, you had now also the mouse, suddenly, the mouse, pardon me, suddenly it becomes possible for someone to realize, hey, there's an opportunity to combine just, you know, cloth or 
foam or something together with um, uh, some backing to produce a mouse pad. Suddenly I know what a mouse pad is. Back, you know, three steps early in the process, I can't guess what a mouse pad is. Now suddenly I can, uh, there has emerged this niche for the mouse pad. So that's kind of our representative example of how new combinations of goods create new economic niches, new potential markets. All right. So we have the story of combinations ramifying over time. New niches ramify over time, new combinations. And, 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 and what are those uh, new niches? They're the opportunity to make new combinations, uh, produce new goods out of new combinations of old goods. Well, that's gonna introduce novelty. And that novelty implies therefore that entrepreneurs and others in the economy will experience uncertainty. You can kind of see how this works. Once uh, it's, it's, it's always hard to predict there's the, there's the old joke often uh, imputed to Yogi Berra that it's hard to predict, especially the future. Uh, well, that's right. Uh, so prediction is always hard. One step forward prediction is relatively easy though. Two step prediction is harder. Three step forward prediction harder still, and so on. For any economists in the audience, this is something, uh, if I may be allowed a brief digression, uh, Keynes in, in, in chapter 12 of the general theory has just a long run and a short run. So um, he doesn't have this gradation of futures. And so the long run is just kind of, um, if I may caricature it uh, just a bit, it's this kind of great void in Keynes, which does exaggerate uh, our uncertain, what our uncertainty of the future is like. Anyway, getting back to our lecture. So how about finding your niche in the platform economy? I want to be careful here. I want these next few comments to represent, um, to be suggestive. I don't want to pretend that we're going to tell you, you know, how to find your niche in the platform economy or explain the platform economy to, to entrepreneurs who are in it. Uh, so I hope these comments would, will be sort of suggestive of how the framework we've tried to lay out in the earlier slides may be helpful to, to entrepreneurs seeking indeed to find their niche in the platform economy. Well, of course, it's a, it's a discovery process and there are no guarantees. We must, of course, when looking forward into the future, always expect the unexpected. But I think the vision of the theory of the adjacent possible and this evolutionary vision we've tried to put forward does uh, suggest that some domains are going to be more predictable than others. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, think about when, you know, two cuisines come together, right? Uh, so, so that's kind of the realm of cooking and cuisine. Well, that's relatively predictable. What's going to happen if we bring two, two uh, cuisines together? Well, the number of elements, uh, you know, that you might put into the, to a dish is stable. The rules of interaction are fairly stable. And so there's certain predictability about it. Okay. What about something like, you know, fine art. Well, that's really quite unpredictable. What, what constitutes art? What are the materials you use? What are the rules for combining those materials? All of that is, is hot, extremely dynamic and uh, constantly in flux. So, you know, cooking or cuisine is a relatively predictable domain, fine art, a relatively unpredictable domain. And you see that in technology too. You have something like, you know, the famous Moore's law, number of transistor, transistors per chip doubles every like one or two years uh, versus Clark's, Arthur C. Clark, Clark's third law that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Okay? So, you know, if we try to look forward, you know, imagine the future of technology. Uh, uh, once we get, you know, very far forward from where we are now, we start to lose sight of what's a possible future technology and what's just magical thinking that's silly and can't happen. We don't know. It's indistinguishable to us. So um, that shows you how there are within technology sort of subdomains that may be relatively predictable like cooking and cuisine. Uh, well, nevertheless, at least some subdomains are not because the whole thing has that strange property that we, we have trouble distinguishing innovation from just magic. So how, are, you know, how predictable is, is your domain? if you're searching for your place in the uh, platform economy. Well, ask yourself, are the elements being combined unchanging? Are the rules of combination stable? 
if, if the answer to both questions is yes, you know, not, not very dynamic there, the number of elements being combined. Yes, pretty stable rules of combination. Uh, then you may be in a relatively knowable domain. And so novel intermediation may be helpful to you. We can ask, you know, incumbents in the field for help and they may be, may be able to offer it. Or indeed, if you have experience in this field, you may be able to offer to others not the services of novelty intermediation, uh, whereby you know you you can kind of scope out the territory. You know what the map of the territory looks like, so you have some ability to discriminate. You know, sort of uh, better bets from worse bets, um, uh, plans that are, are have a prospect, and, that, and plans that are just sort of unrelated to the structure of the field. That novelty intermediation. Okay, maybe it's something that you might want to. Do. Maybe that's your niche in the. Uh, platform economy. So, you know, our examples, cooking and chip making, you have a stable set of ingredients, you have a stable set of rules, art and high tech. And no, those things are not stable. All right, that's what I have to say so far. Now let's go to Q&A. Thank you all very much. Great, thank you. Hi. Sure, let's open the scope for questions. Yeah, hi. Uh, it's, uh, it's really an enlightening view to, for me, uh, a PhD of economics, to look at economic ecosystem and the competition and the like. But I actually have two questions. Uh, please forgive me if my questions sound a bit offensive, but it's really because I'd like to understand it better. So the first one is, uh, how does this perspective of, of the eco uh, economic ecosystem different from uh, agnosticism, since as you just mentioned that niche emergency is unpredictable. So basically we know something is going on, but we cannot have any idea about it. What can we do? Is it true that it somehow console ourselves by letting us understand better about the situation we're in and get used to it? So a second question by related is, I understand that uh, for example, niche partitioning or niche uh, emergence and diversification can help the population or species or the ecosystem to stay sustainable. But I'm wondering um, if the eco uh, ecologist can provide any advices for an individual in a population or in a species, except telling them that it's uncertain and no guarantee so that they can, so that they can actually survive better. For example, what they can do uh, to take a niche space during competition or cooperation, because um, now you you just mentioned some are some niche uh, emergence are more predictable and some are less. So which are more? Uh, you, you mentioned some of it. Uh, so what shall we do for the more predictable and less predictable, respectively? And what where might be the direction of research on that? We, we can, from my understanding, we cannot stay just there. We want to improve our, uh, the, the living conditions. Uh, yeah, that's just my uh, related to questions. Thank you. May I just make sure I understand what the question is? Uh, I, I think the sort of initial challenge, please you know, set me straight if I didn't understand you. I think the initial challenge was um, that, you know, how, how do I avoid essentially, how do I avoid just kind of fatalism? Well, things, things happen. Right? Yeah. That's kind of your question. Yeah. Uh, well, that is, that is the question. Um, at, at one level, you know, at, at some sufficiently distanced level, you know, so, so who cares? You know, the system's working, right? It produces all this great, you know, flourishing of technology. Look how humanity has been, um, lifted to a level of wealth unimaginable to our, our predecessors and so on. Um, but that doesn't help you neg negotiate this, this mad fields now. Yeah, uh, so that is the question. Um, but we ha I think we have to grapple with the, uh, I know this is sort of a non-answer, um, but I think we have to grapple with the, the perplexing reality that we actually have. So, um, we, we need solution criteria. We need solution criteria or, or you know, uh, policy programs that um, 
recognize and respect the complexity of events. So one sort of you know, rule of thumb is that uh, low complexity solutions to high complexity problems may easily fail. Okay? So just, just knowing what it is and isn't possible is I think progress and, and, and valid and legitimate and so on. Okay? Even, if, even if disappointingly you know, uh, agnostic, I think that was your word agnostic. That's all. I think that's all I want to say on that. Roberto, Brian? Yeah. Oh, may, may I add something on that? So, uh, I, I completely agree that this, uh, no, this view can leave you a little bit scared about what we can do in future also because, no, one of the questions is how to address a sustainable future that we are all aiming to. And uh, so, uh, no, uh, gathering examples from biological systems where in ecosystems you have the biological constraints, no, that are physical, chemical, uh, evolutionary constraints that address the evolution uh, somehow. Uh, of course, these are network processes, but they also apply to us because, first of all, we have a carrying capacity that we used to don't respect because with technology, we expand over and over our you know, uh, technological niche. And so we take uh, much more of the, the biomass that would be uh, you know, sustainable in this, uh, if we consider in this term. So I think on our level, you know, on a social economical level, uh, what, what could, could be uh, considered something that we can predict or at least address is you know, seeding uh, the right policies, because of course, uh, if we have some political constraints or socio-economical constraints, then we can uh, more easily address, at least if not predict, you know, the evolution of the crowd. Imagine the case of pesticides, for instance. You know, if we ban all pesticides all, all over the world, like you know, how we did with DDT, of course, there won't be any other even evolutionary niche, you no know, technologically. Uh, speaking uh, for uh, chemicals in agriculture, let's say. No, in this way, we are addressing uh, somehow the future. We cannot predict what the next technology would be, but at least we know what want, uh, what we, we, we won't have uh, and uh, towards which kind of sustainable technology we are, we are moving. Um, this is just something that we can at least, you no, know, like in uh, uh, in uh, parallel evolution or in co-evolution in biological terms, we can at least expect to find, you no, know, thinking in a uh, uh, Darwinian way. Yeah, I think maybe a more practical question is: Is there any uh, new or old branches that uh, studies the more micro level of uh, of the uh, individuals in uh, in ecosystem or in a species or things like that. Because for, for for me, uh, I understand uh, the the view I take to understand the e economy is is um is from more agent based or uh, micro based to understand how intuitively everything happens instead of from a higher level that some uh, aggregate statistics tells us, so I'm wondering if there's a subfield in ecology that can do something related. May, may I offer a site? A site? Sure, sure. sure. Um, yeah, um, first, I mean, you know, yes to agent-based models, to kind of micro foundations, to sort of bottom up. I, I don't yeah. think, you know, I don't think this view, for example, uh, uh, requires us to uh, abandon price theory. I think, on the contrary, we should we should hang on to price theory. Um, th this sort of grand, you know, I don't know how much you you know your Val Ross, but I mean, boy, he had some ambitions, right? So some of these kind of grand, okay, that's, but um, but 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 good old humble price theory is still very much on the table for me, certainly as an economist. Um, the, the the site that may help you is um, ecosystem management as a wicked problem, W-I-C-K-E-D, as a wicked okay. problem, science 2017. Ecosystem okay. management as a wicked problem. And one of the co-authors of that paper is Ruth de Fries and um, Harini Najendra. W one of them uh, also worked with and has co-authored with uh, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who has also addressed this issue that, that uh, for for sustainability, for you know issues uh, related to the crisis of the Anthropocene, 
uh, polycentric solutions are likely to be more successful than monocentric solutions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. May I ask question. something? I have a question. Yep. Hello. Yes, yes, please. We can hear you. Go ahead. Yes. So, yeah. So, if we have to live in a world that the innovations are or the new species are emergent, we need to have a set of the methodology or principles to deal with it. So, and it's not, so we can give definitions, but I think my colleague, uh, she just asked is that she's not satisfied with the, uh, with the set of, if, from my observation, it's just the, the, the distance between biology and the or ecosystem with the social science is still very big. And if I, I'm looking at the, for example, the your material constraints, I'm trying to convert and I feel I'm lost immediately. For example, ecosystems conserve matter and energy. Please tell me in the ecosystem of platform, what is matter? What is yeah. energy? Yeah. And the second, all process participative and irreversible. Tell me, in a platform economy, what is dissipative? What is irreversible? And stuff like that. So my, my point is that there's a huge gap between how we can apply the stuff. I think you guys give the, 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 the nice thing about the biology, I think we love it. So is that it provides the more, uh, it's like more really many perspective of what we think about. It's much more complex than the simple economics, but the gap is still very huge. And I'm, okay, even we convince ourselves, you see at Alibaba, so we're looking at, we, we fully agree this is the, it's about emergence. We see the growth is more about variety, diversity, new species. We see all kinds of new products coming up every day. We have like a billions of products on Alibaba's platform. They all coming up with this competition through niches. So we get that point. But what's the principle? How do you uh, foster a good ecosystem? What are the principles? If things are emergent, what can we do? So stuff, how do you build the good infrastructure to, 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 to support that? All kind of stuff are missing for me. Maybe you can say something about it. Leo, let me actually jump in there <clears throat> um, because you actually hit, I think, two of the easier ones to make the connection um, about the first and second laws of thermodynamics because if all material is conserved, uh, it, it's you know, the, the actual physical stuff comes from somewhere, right? And I think we forget that. We forget that there's an environment or we forget that there's nature out there. One of the, or we just started our semester last week and one of the questions I had my students go is, you know, they all think of this as the platform economy, or at least their, their entrance into it. I said, what's in here? What are some of the rare earth elements? Where do they come from? My students have never been to Mongolia or South Africa, but they're carrying Mongolia around in their pockets, right? That's the physical constraint, right? So they're, they're actual pieces of the earth in this that we need to have and we need to have access to and we need to have um, renewing, right? Because these are, these are um, limited rare earth elements. And because it's there's a um, because the second law says it's dissipative, we need to keep keep plugging it in. Every day I have to recharge my phone. I need to have access to you know clean re renewable energy uh, technology in order to, to uh, turn this uh, to recharge it right because it's a uh, it's an open system. It's dissipating. It's giving off a little bit of heat every time I want to access the platform economy from my smartphone. So so those are fundamental, right? I mean, that doesn't answer the question from the first speaker was like, well, how do we then practically, you know, put that into the sense of the, the, the microeconomics and the daily activities. But, but I think that those, you know, forgetting those um, fundamentals is, is, is also a recipe for disaster, right? So that we think that we can operate up here in the Netherlands, but not grounded in the actual physical space that the planet is providing for us. So that's why I think Roberta was trying to make the connection that the, the well, to, to the sustainability is, is respecting those kinds of those constraints that we have. That's the gap between the natural science and the social science. Uh, because the let's say if you imagine if you are in some entrepreneur's shoes or some managers who's operating on the 
on the e-commerce. And uh, the, the goal of that is to make the whole platform prosper, more uh, products coming up and the better ones flourish and the better all kind of stuff. And for them, they would want to learn something from you. And you tell them that everything as a physical side of that, it's not really satisfactory to, to them. So that's my point. That is, there's a huge gap. So what about from a what I, assessment, would that be useful then to like really to understand, uh, you know, we think of it, maybe you think of it in terms of supply chains. I just need this element, go get it for me somewhere out on a supply chain. But to build in from the beginning ground up again in, in a kind of a, environmentally sustainable way where where those resources come from where they're going end of product life i mean that those are those are very practical questions that any any entrepreneur is going to need to ask and and hopefully answer um yeah but but they are exactly learning not learning from 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 this for example if i am a company i'm trying to see what is my niche what should i do and right. what are the uh so what are the principles one should follow when the, the world is emergent on a platform? It's fierce competition. So what can they do? So, so those are kind of stuff. It's, it's not immediately. I'm trying to push. I, I'm, I really appreciate yeah, what yeah, you yeah. tell us. I'm um, trying to push I see, further on this. I think Roger raised uh, his hand. Maybe yeah. Roger is watching well, something. The thing about that before I, before I pass it over back to Roger was because I think also to follow up on Joan's question, the first one about, which is the same one, you know, if it's so unpredictable, what do we do? And even though we have an emergent exploding um, space of opportunity, it's that edge where that theory of the adjacent possible, it's that adjacent possible is the edge of, it's the path dependency, right? So as, as was mentioned, you're not going to have a market for computer uh, mouse pads before there's computers and there's interfaces. And so, so what, the, what the entrepreneur would be doing is looking at that edge and trying to understand what are the, what are the pieces that can come together at that edge um, through the kind of, you know, the path dependencies. At least that's my understanding of, of how it might be useful. But yes, let me pass it over to Roger, who may, I, I would ex expect has a more econ economically sound answer than what I gave. Um, let me, sorry. Who was speaking? Go ahead, somebody just was jumping in. I just want to give you one example to see, uh, you're talking about this adjacent stuff, like the what you can do within your capacity stuff. I was having a, a conversation with somebody else, uh, Alibaba, and they were talking about back in 2009, they decided to, to invest heavily in cloud computing. And at that time, uh, I guess Alibaba, the so so that's something and made Alibaba to be the best in cloud computing in China or the top three in the world right now. So, but that is not immediately clear. This is something they should, they will uh, wing out. But there's another example is I was discuss, discussing, debating with another person is then should Alibaba do something about help people to build cars when it's the AI stuff, things like that. Then how is that adjacent? With a very far away. My, my point is that uh, what we are learning, those concepts, it's not, it'd be nice to have one, one step further to have some kind of principle to say what is adjacent, what is, it's a fantasy, yeah, stuff like that. Pure concept is not enough. Yeah. Um, I want to make just a couple of uh, comments before getting to a direct addressing your, your question. Um, there's two issues here. You know, you mentioned some some potential disanalogies between biology and economics. Um, so th that just inspired me to, to point out that there's there's two issues here. Uh, one is useful analogies, and the other is integrating the social and biological sciences. So uh, analogies, you know, they always have their their limits. Um, so in a sense, I'm not too concerned about, you know, where the points of disanalogy might lie. If I can get some benefit out of the points of positive analogy, great, cool. Uh, but but we, we point in our paper to uh, actually um, to an integration of biology and um, the social sciences. And we, we should have cited a famous paper you, you can't believe the author's names when you hear it, when you hear the title of the paper. The author's names are, and this is not a joke, Lionel Tiger and Robin Fox. 
And the name, the title of their famous classic article of 1965 was The Zoological Perspective, The Zoological <laughs> Perspective in the Social Sciences. Uh, so so we, we favor both, you know, exploiting such analogies as may be convenient and adopting a zoological perspective in the social sciences. And we think that's quite meaningful in the history of technology when you consider that uh, the history of technology seems to go back 3.3 million years ago to the first napped, known napped tools by uh, Australopithecus af afarensis, well, that's before Genus Homo even existed. So uh, we think there's something real about having that uh, integrated vision. So that was, that was, but that's not getting to your exact point. Um, principles, I, I think, you know, one of the things that emerges from this is you need kind of uh, stable rules for the game if, if uh, right, okay. So, so stability of the uh, rules, what, what is uh, sometimes called an Anglo-American uh, legal tradition of uh, the rule of law is, is very important. That term rule of law is often used in American political discourse to mean being tough on bad doers and all this sort of stuff. But I mean the legal concept, stable rules, that's very important. I wrote a book addressing that quite a bit in 2002. Um, but at the end of the day, I have to disappoint you. There's no algorithms. Okay? So we need entrepreneurs. I work in a business school, the business professors, uh, some of them, a minority of business professors, hold on to this kind of fantasy that we can figure out the algorithm okay, that says what's a good business idea, what's a bad business idea, what the entrepreneur ought to do. Um, uh, so so if, if that were a sensible ambition, we wouldn't need the entrepreneurs. We could hand it all over to the business professors and their computers. But we in fact need the entrepreneurs. In, in, in a polycentric order in which novelty is emergent. Okay? There's no substitute for the, for the um, heterogeneous entrepreneurial project in which you get, you know, the different actors get to bet on their ideas. Okay? And, you, and, and you're not gonna know ahead of time which ones are gonna work, which ones aren't. Why should we be in a better position than they are in physics? Where it is an established result by David Walpert and others that we, the observing uh, scientists, cannot process information more rapidly than the universe. Okay. Economists are not in a better position. Okay, uh, I see Professor Wei is uh, raising his hand. Thank you. So I want to uh, thank all three authors for a very fascinating uh, uh, presentation, a very uh, thought, uh, thought uh, provoking. I, I, um, I want to, uh, I guess, get um, more uh, uh, guidance or more benefits out of uh, this uh, analogy uh, for, uh, for, for economics. So, so, so a couple of questions related to that. Uh, one um, uh, is, uh, you know, when you look at the, how the existing economics literature, uh, you know, deal with some of the problems that your work also touch on, what is missing in, uh, in the economics uh, uh, way of, economist way of thinking of the problem. So for example, in terms of a diversity and how to explain diversity, in, in 1970s, there's this, uh, you know, Dixie Stiglitz attempt to model this. They, 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 they starts with the assumption that people generally prefer as many possible varieties as, as, as possible. And this inspires people like Paul Krugman to explore this very aggressively, and eventually got Nobel Prize, essentially by very aggressively exploiting uh, exploiting uh, Dixie Dix Stiglitz's utility function to explain to provide explanation for what, what he called uh, intra-industry uh, theory. So, from your uh, perspective, what is missing in Krugman's way of thinking about uh, and, and Dixie Stiglitz's way of thinking about diversity? That's number one. Number two, uh, you know, uh, in terms uh, in in understanding economic growth, uh, uh, Mar Martin Weizmann who unfortunately passed away last uh, yeah. the year before, two years before, um, thought about the uh, source of economic growth is combining existing stuff and recombining existing stuff and doing more of those. Kind of, kind of a similar to uh, 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 one of the things uh, 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 you presented. So when you look at his work in, uh, in his theory of economic growth, what's missing in his way of thinking about this, you know, you know given the, your, your perspective. Another related question is, this is somewhat, link, I guess, linked to uh, Long's uh, uh, question. That is, um, in eco 
in ecology, my, my superficial understanding is we think about every species trying to survive and their desire give us a lot of stuff, filling, filling up niches, creating diversity and so on. Uh, uh, in uh, sociology and you know, in actual platform uh, firms uh, that the long uh, works with, uh, firms are profit maximizing. Uh, uh, and, and sometimes you know, economists uh, uh, claim that sometimes the profit maximizing individuals can lead to outcomes that socially not optimal. And, you know, so there's a class of uh, reasons for market failures. What would be the, uh, uh, is there, what would be the analogy in, uh, in ecological evolution? And what would be the uh, insight from ecological evolution for addressing those problems that you think that economists might have been, you know, uh, might have been missing or might, might have been wrongheaded? So, so, so let me, let me uh, see if I can get some uh, guidance from you guys on, on these three questions. Thank you. That's great. So who, who begins? Who starts? I can say something about the last part of the question on the ecological side. Maybe you want to go on the more economical side. Yeah, go. Sure, go. OK, so start. OK, so starting from the end. Uh, so you, you're right, no, because this is uh, uh, also a general question in, uh, in ecology, you know, why for the, the benefit of the individual species, you no, know, why the ecosystem are so stable uh, instead, no, like in the social economic system that, of course, there is a continuous maximizing of the profit. But this is the, exactly the same for species, you no, know, they try to maximize their fitness. Um, is the system that adjusts itself. Uh, the, the species actually have no foresight. No, they don't look for the benefit of the whole ecosystem, but in a certain way, they contribute to it. It's just the system, no, this the, uh, idea of the self-adjusting ecosystem or even the Gaia theory. No? There is a, a, a complexity of the interactions and of course, working uh, towards the carrying capacity as the simplistic example. No? You might know the Lotka Volterra uh, typical no uh, binary equation where you have predators and prey or two uh, uh, competing species that of course by growing one uh, on one end on this one that is increasing population the, the second one has to decrease the population and they adapt to each other so no one can prevail otherwise they would both disappear uh, so in a more complex system where you have uh, hundreds of species of course there are continuous adjustments to each other. And I guess something similar happens uh, in the social systems because no one is actually uh, leaving and working for the benefits uh, of others. Everyone tries to maximize its own profit, its own uh, fitness in some way. So uh, there is adjustment also in ecosystem. We shouldn't think about the ecosystem as a perfect system with all species try to be kind with each other. Uh, of course, from this continuous, no, uh, let's say, beginning of competition and then avoidance of it, because we are very in favor of facilitation process, cooperative process, more than competitive process. As Brian said before, uh, this uh, competitive exclusion principle could work just in theory, but if you really look uh, at the empirical example, you have uh, no competition, or at least a uh, no, every every uh, every relationship is an attempt to avoid competition towards cooperation, for instance. So establishing a symbiosis, symbiotic relationship, mutualistic relationship. This actually is something that I also see from, uh, 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 let's say, um, uh, not completely uh, um, no, uh, un aware of the economic system, but I see in the real socioeconomic system, because of course you have continuous actors that compete uh, to each other that at a certain point could find a way to be more uh, resilient and also more successful just going together and establishing cooperatives, for instance, also in the economic system. So I think uh, there is very uh, high level of similarity between biological system and economic system. I mean, just, just a comment on this. You know, some of the collaboration and cooperation among individuals can be good for those individuals that cooperate firms, but can be bad for the society as a whole. So these are the monopolistic, you know, uh, collusion examples, right? So, so we consider, you know, collusion is good. Cooperation is good for those firms, but bad for the society. And then we normally think, I mean, they, 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 so the economists think that uh, 
that uh, at least the dominant view uh, is that uh, society needs to find a way to to correct correct that kind of uh, action. So I wonder there must whether there's an analogy from uh, evolutionary biology that tells us that maybe the economist approach is wrong, or maybe economists are insufficiently imaginative. There may be alternative ways to address the same problems. That will be that will be great. I think it's uh, just uh, uh, sorry, Brian. Just uh, say, just concluding that. I think it's just a matter of time frame, no of time scale. Because even in biology, you know, if you look at the very short time, short short term, you see that uh, it seems that species are actually competing for it. But if you look at the short, at uh, the long term, you you, all, you you always find something that is moving towards avoidance of competition because it's of course consume more energy and it's not the, 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 the most fittest way to do that. And uh, I see something similar. If you look in uh, at the economic system in the long term, then you will see that the whole system will try to push out this disadvantage, even collaboration, because that will bring to the deficit, for instance, for the whole system or to the economic problem, I think. So uh, I don't know uh, if if good way to uh, trying to find a way. Sorry, Brian. Uh, I was just going to add one more thing to it. Yeah, I, I agree that it's as, as Roberto said, it's about the networking and it's about time scales. But one of the other differences that um, that the ecosystem uh, is dealing with is the um, is the currency. It's basically a real time you know, solar energy based currency that you know storing the energy is possible, but it's quite complicated, and and so. Um, whereas, you know, the economic system is dealing with the currency that you can borrow into the future, currencies that you can just basically create by putting some zeros in a computer. And it, it becomes divorced again from those physical realities that we think are important to keep in mind. Um, and therefore, they can run off in directions that, that perhaps ecosystems are, are more constrained and can't, can't do so. But I think Roger probably has some, again, insight into the economics yeah, I'll, thank you. I'll, I'll try to be quick because we want more people to participate if possible. We addressed uh, Dixit Stigler in, in the paper. Um, so you can read that. It's, it's not uh, an evolutionary model. There's no ramifying. So there's, there's product heterogeneity, but there's not, there's not this ramifying process. We think that makes a difference. This is a, a far from equilibrium, or maybe the better term would be a non-equilibrium model. Okay. Whereas, you know, it, it's, it's imperfect, you know, it's Chamberlain and, and uh, Robinson, it's imperfect or a monopolistic competition in that Dixit Stigler tradition. So we think that makes a difference. We address it in the paper. Uh, the key really being this issue of, is there sort of endogenous ramifying? Yeah. And, I, I, and I think it makes a difference that the answer is no for that tradition, yes, for, for us. Uh, Weitzman is uh, certainly a relevant name, yeah. I addressed with Stu Kaufman and others in a related paper kind of companion piece, uh, we address Weitzman. Uh, sure, he's very close. It's, it's, you know, needs to be recognized and acknowledged. I think we may claim that our humble equation that we have, that so-called TAP equation, I think it has the advantage of simplicity. Uh, Weitzman was talking about combining ideas. We talk about combining goods. Is that a substantive difference? I actually think it is. I, I think that um, uh, part of the, one of the consequences of integrating social sciences and the, and the biological sciences is somewhat downgrading sort of ratiocination, you know, sort of the, the economic rationality of a kind of cliched neoclassical model. Uh, we kind of downgrade that. After all, if, if we're right to trace the process all the way back to you know 3.3 million years ago to to uh, these pre-Homo creatures, I mean they had a, a brain size. I think it was. Forgive me if I'm getting this wrong, but substantially smaller, something like two thirds of our current brain size, or was it one third? I'm I'm now momentarily forgetting. It's much smaller brain. So is it sensible to impute the sort of plan for rationality of a cliched textbook? Uh, neoclassical model to such a creature, I don't think so. And yet that seems to be the origins of the evolutionary process generating the current technosphere. Okay. So I think, um, I, I think that's also a difference. And finally, Weitzman, uh, you know, Weitzman puts in a constraining factor. He's, um, he's trying to find the, the steady state. That's not the same project. So he just kind of takes a similar begin, very similar beginning, but then he moves it off to in a very different direction than ourselves. Okay. 
And, and I think that also makes a difference. Uh, as for market failure, I mean, you know, it was a, it was a crisis for many uh, Christian scholars in the wake of Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, when, when it was sort of revealed some of the terrible cruelties in nature. So I, I think just as we should not imagine the, the ecosphere as some sort of paradise, right? I mean, we have the centripetality, we have this idea of mutualism in our vision of uh, 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 autocatalytic evolution, but that doesn't mean everything is wonderful and happy and everybody's, you know, chirping and the, and the rainbows are always there. Uh, nature can be cruel and uh, destructive. So I, I don't think that we're obliged to some, uh, any similar view of, um, uh, you, you know, lollipops and unicorns in the market economy. Uh, at the same time, I don't think that we're, you know, this way of thinking about it is developed enough that we have any like proposals for uh, regulation or something like that beyond that continuing admonition that polycentric processes have advantages over monocentric processes. I hope that's a sort of a, a real answer to you, Professor White. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're about, you know, we have used all the time, but if anyone has small questions, and actually I have one, but um, we'll give priority to others. Uh, I see uh, Simon turn, turn up your, your, your video. Do you have a question? Um, I just introduced myself. I'm a mathematician and I'm at the Cambridge UK. Um, I, I just, I'm, I'm interested in um, um, complexity and uh, network theory. Just by, um, first, thank you very much for, for, the, for, the, for the seminar. It's really uh, interesting. I'm just thinking a, a question by Professor Chen. He's asking about what is, what might be um, a practical advice uh, the, your theory can give to, you, yeah. to the entrepreneurs. Um, I think you, you guys were saying it's probably very difficult because th there's still a huge gap and uh, to connect them. Um, I just come across something recently, maybe you, you guys already know very well. There, 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 there's a theory in social, um, social networks called structure holes, um, oh, yeah. developed by uh, Ronan Burt. I, I just think uh, some, some of uh, his stuff might, be, might play a, a bridging role between the two, because what, one thing he emphasizes is um, in terms of um, uh, the structure hole is, you know, when there is a gap between two individuals with complementary resources of information, and when the, these two individuals were connected through like a third individual as an entrepreneur, the gap is filled and creating an important advantage for the entrepreneur. So if we, if we imagine um, like on a platform or in a society, we would have a, say a set of uh, social networks or people who would encode, I would say encode um, method or knowledge about producing different kinds of goods. Or if we're talking about like cutting edge, they would probably encode, some of them encode like cryptocurrency blockchain, some encode say AI, and some would encode knowledge about um, say quantum computing. And I think an entrepreneur who can plug in to, or who can connect to all these different people or different groups and somehow be able to see how these technology could be combined in a unique way would really benefit from um, would really benefit from integrating these uh, these these existing or emerging products. So I, I think um, th there is actually um, a, a practical or bridge that potentially exists, um, although probably in a different uh, uh, domain in social network analysis that can uh, can actually say there is a concrete advice we can we can give to give to entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know if I if I explained this very well. No, that's that's great. We we should say for the sake of others who are not familiar with this literature, uh, whole is spelled H O L, not W H O L E, but H O L E. In other words, gaps in the structure. That's the structural holes of which uh, Burke and others, Bert and others were um, speaking. Uh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that connection. That's great. I like it a lot. That's very suggestive. Thank you for that suggestion. 
we, we do in another paper um, talk about, uh, there's a management literature on technological distance, which I think has some similarities here. Um, but this is much more uh, intriguing and suggestive to me. So I, I appreciate that quite a bit. Um, actually, um, I have a question uh, just related to what, what Simon was having, because um, in this paper, you mostly talk about the products, how they evolve, but um, you know, the, the, you, you can't you know, develop these products. I mean, this combination cannot happen without necessary technologies, which you, you know, for the sake of the paper, you are not explicitly uh, addressing, but there are uh, quite, quite a number of you know, like literature on, on technology kind of evolution, combinatorial evolution of technologies, you know, yep. whether you define them as hard technology or actually include innovation, even ideas as the broad definition of technology. So, um, so, so, so in a way, uh, they, re they reinforce or they, you know, divorce from each other. So, you know, the more products are used, so the technology behind it, you know, the technologies behind the products are, uh, are also surviving better. So there, there's, at least there are two layers like this. And 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 also the same thing behind these are are the knowledge. I mean, or maybe the the resources necessary to put them together. Uh, uh, either knowledge, like what Simon said, the social network behind it, or maybe you know organizational you know network. Um, so together, they, it seemed to me that they, there are you know in reality there are these kind of multi multi level networks across different oh, oh, yeah. couple of dimensions. And what would you know? Is there is there something around that 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 really integrate things like this here together? And also one major difference that I see between the biological ecological system uh, and the socioeconomic system that we're more interested in um, is not only the time scale, which was already made explicit, because we are we're operating at a much smaller time scale, uh, you know, uh, but also that there there's value in in here, and there's also specific purpose seeking. Uh, in a process, um, so that we, you know, th th there's a limit of, of how much we can apply uh, and, and the biological kind of principles or, you know, ecological principles here. So um, how do we op operationalize these, you know, so, so do we stay, you know, at the high level principles or how do we operationalize these thinking into some specific problems? Let's say in, in you know, what Long was just mentioning on the platform, what is Amazon? What is Alibaba? Um, millions and billions of products are emerging, uh, and it's probably accelerating. Uh, and what would be the next step? You know that we start from here, not necessarily going to you know some small kind of each single uh, products. How do we operationalize these thinking into uh, not algorithms, but you know something in the middle, right? Well, that's that's the question. Uh, th there is absolutely a link to networks, you know, we're talking about networks. And so network theory is going to be a tool that we expect to be very useful in pursuing this kind of a vision. So, you know, a big yes to that. Um, I'm not sure that distinction about value and purpose seeking is as um, great as you make it, actually. Um, I, I think uh, that, I think in the biosphere, value and, and, and purpose seeking can be found as well. Uh, and in fact, the theory of affordances, which emerges from ethology, I think is very helpful in uh, this vision of the zoological perspective in the social sciences based on this kind of evolutionary view. I don't know if uh, Roberto and uh, Brian would say the same thing. Uh. Yeah, no, I was just yeah, a reflection on that. Or maybe it could be, a, I don't know if I'm able to give a suggestion to economists but, or, or platform economists, but uh, something that we, we learned from biological system is that the future of species, and in this case, the future of a goods that could be part of an ecosystem in case of platforms, for instance, depends very much on the current, uh, no? so the, the, the goods and species that we have now. So addressing uh, the, the kind of species and the kind of goods that we have at the moment could actually uh, in some, some ways, of course, uh, address the future of the, the, the goods and uh, emerging products that we have. Uh, this is uh, not uh, something that is related also to the free market. 
somehow. Uh, of course, uh, it's difficult to limit you know, the, the number and the, the kind of goods that you have at the moment. But in, in, in ecosystems, uh, we, we, we won't expect to have, for instance, an elephant if we had just insects. No, yeah. uh, so uh, this is something that translating in economic terms could mean something. Right. Yeah, yeah, I mean a lot, a lot there. I, I think yeah, you're you're ask, obviously asking the right the right question. I I agree that that networks are are going to be part of the answer. Um, as far as just the the point about the uh, the agency, I I think it comes back also maybe to the time scale. I mean there are. Um, the, you know, humans have, have anticipatory skills that other uh, organisms don't. And so there, there again, leads us to use resources that don't even really exist yet, or that we don't have access to buying futures. And we see what's happening with GameStop right now. I mean, it's all the, you know, the anticipations of somebody doing something and, you know, that, that's something that is, is different than, than you see in, in an ecosystem. Um, it just makes it harder to to predict. It's it's at least sec second or third level, as Roger was describing. But yeah, I don't have the answers. Good questions. <clears throat> it, it is our yeah, hope that this right. paper would be kind of an enabler for for you know other people to make their questions and do their work, and not a set of like pat answers. If 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 we're right to think we're onto something, it's kind of big. It's it's not a, a modest you know filling a small uh, gap in the literature or something. Uh, but if that's true, then it's kind of open-ended and it's not clear where it's going. And, and I, I like that. You're opening a niche, a big one, <laughs> potential. Uh, I, I, I like to think we're opening an entire uh, ecosystem yeah. for inquiry. Yeah. Okay, we're about, uh, you know, we're, we're 14 minutes over the time. Simon, do you have any final comments? Um, I, I I was just actually thinking about uh, your question regarding the agency and in terms of um, like purpose and value. Um, I, I just probably wish to mention one last point. I, I, I think, again, I think uh, Bert's work may be bridging the gap between yeah. what Roger and uh, Roberto and Brian is doing and what you were asking. Because I think what an, another thing Bert mentioned uh, with regard to the purpose, uh, or you said a self a selfish a pursuit of their the personal interest is I think he did he did lots lots of studies regarding uh, in social networks regarding who would actually get most return on their invested efforts, and he actually found it, it is those people who were well connected, especially well connected to people who has different skills so who had very different knowledge sets. And these people were most able to recombine these a different uh, potentially products or product knowledge into something completely new. So that's one thing he finds. Another concept he, he has is called closeness. He, he, he kind of emphasizes called closeness. And that's, I think, relates to your point about organizational building. And he, 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 I think one of his points is um, it's not important just to bridge those gaps, just to bring those, those knowledge together. You have to create a, a close net group or organization around those bridges so that you can have a stable organization that can exploit the new niche or the new possible combination really well. So I think there are two, two kind of uh, two concepts that can potentially uh, bridge eco ecological perspective and probably a very entrepreneurial and kind of um, social perspective. Thanks. Um, actually, I that you know I have some corroboration. On our second point, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, Dennis Meadows, um, the lead author of the uh, Living Through Growth, was visiting Yasa, and he was mentioning you know some of his recent findings that if you really want to do something for the world, you gather about 50 people really on top of that issue. And that's the, uh, pretty much the critical mass uh, that you need <laughs> to change the issue. So, mm -hmm. you know, in, in a way it's similar to what you say, you know, like you need mm -hmm. a key uh, group. And also mm -hmm. what Long was also, you know, talking with us about, about Steve Jobs, 
get the best people together and they know how to work together. Um, yeah. you know, at least for some of these very successful uh, stories um, of, mm -hmm. of these major companies. But of course, mm -hmm. uh, we don't see the, the, the failures. Some of them are also great. So mm -hmm. um, we're 17 minutes over the limit. Uh, and we started from 60, uh, four, five pe uh, 65 people. And then we still have 33, you know, almost uh, midnight here in China. So uh, we really appreciate your uh, attendance to this webinar. And uh, in about, I think our next one will be after the Chinese New Year, but uh, we will still were very welcoming all of you to uh, come back again. And in the, uh, in the chat box, you will see that uh, the first one, we, we do have uh, a serving monkey form that if you, uh, if you are, you know, not uh, uh, subscribing to already to our uh, newsletter or, or our emails, uh, you can do that. So may I add a, one more thing? Yeah. May I, I would like to add one more sentence. So basically, I especially I really thank thank the three presenters for your wonderful, inspiring uh, speech, and uh, that helped a lot. But I'm back to my original point. It helped me to realize what a big gap between between a biology and or ecosystem and the social science. The thing we are urgently need to understand a lot of issues. So my call here is that, um, so I was, when I was listening to you guys, I was thinking about some of the principles. Actually, there are a bunch, for example, uh, because you have to have some homogeneity is boring. Basically, what they, that's what they're saying. It's, it's not creating much enough novelty. So we, we need to have some kind of adjacent uh, uh, combination diversity to make the uh, some emergence possible, things like that. But my, my point here is that, uh, is that I think we should, uh, there should be more uh, combining force between the biologists, uh, ecologists, and the, and the social scientists to, 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 to fill in the, the, the structural hole to bring value to this. And I think there's a lot of the, added value here. So that's something to look forward to. Yeah, I guess I am one of those experiments um, in the middle. Uh, let's see whether we can do it. Thanks for those kind remarks yeah. just made. Good challenge, thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you all. Have a good night, good afternoon, or maybe right. good morning. Thank, everybody. Thank, yeah. you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.